Cindy and Laura, thank you guys so much uh, for your time today and, and welcome to the show to Speaking of the Arts. I'm really looking forward to our conversation and I would love to just really let you guys take the reins here and describe what this letter is, what the intent is, kind of how it came about and um, specifically for people who are listening to this right now who actually have not even been made aware of this initiative, what is it and why should they take notice? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Mike, for having us on this episode. I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, so the purpose of our letter is twofold. Um, my colleague Charlotte Lee and I, who co-wrote the letter with me, we decided that the first purpose is definitely to make our state, federal, and congressional leaders aware of how the COVID-19 ramifications are unique to the music industry and the performing arts in general. And number two, to propose a federal relief plan that addresses these unique ramifications. Um, so in the letter, we do provide a lot of data points that kind of show how those who work in the performing arts were not only the first to be affected, you know, in terms of immediate venue and hall closures and artist performances and shows getting canceled en masse for the foreseeable future. Um, but also that our sector will be the last to really resume normal business operations. Um, we touch on how our revenue model is virtually 100% dependent on commissions and fees from our artist fees and slash or ticket sales. And we also emphasize that our ability to return to work is really contingent upon a vaccine getting developed and being available en masse because it's really the only way that venues can refill to capacity, which is the only way that our revenue structure and model can work. Um, just thinking um, logistically, if a hall that seats 1,500 or a stadium that is supposed to pack like 3,000, 5,000 bodies in there can only safely hold an event with like 10% of that. Um, how do you generate revenue? How do you possibly break even from that even? So um, that's kind of the unique situation that we're in versus for example, the hospitality or restaurant industry um, that can safely have customers and patrons socially distance and still stay open, for example. Um, and also, since we're for-profit um, agencies, we are not eligible to draw on these funds that, for example, were allocated in the CARES Act that was passed in March. There was, I think, 75 million allocated to the NEA and then another, they included the Kennedy Center in DC as well um, in that bill. I think it was like 25 million. Um, so finally, like our proposals in the letter, we wanted to propose three. Number one, to extend the EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Number two, um, recapitalize and extend the PPP. And number three, extend the Pandemic Unemployment Benefits Program. Thanks for summarizing it. So what has been the response thus far from the industry? I've felt definitely very encouraged by how positive and welcoming the response has been across management and agencies of all different sizes across the country. Um, everyone has been really supportive and they all can agree on the necessity of an appeal like this one. Um, and a few have also provided really salient feedback um, on the contents of the letter to strengthen our argument, which is very important because I think this whole crisis has taught us to like really broaden our perspective and to be really open to, yeah, like plans change, ideas change but they all have to be like for the better, for the greater good. Um, so that's been really great. Well, I would say too, when I first learned of it, my immediate thought was, I already knew that I wasn't like the only one dealing with this obviously, but just to have this measure or these, this plan in place that kind of ties us all together um, as a community, specifically you know, the agency side of everything, 
felt um, it, it was a good feeling to see that like, yes, we are all dealing with this and here could be a, um, something that can help. So I just want to thank you and your team for like actually taking the time to put this together and now to try and gather more awareness about it. How many people have signed it at this point? Oh, well, thank you so much for your encouragement and your kind feedback. And I definitely have to give as like so much due credit to um, my colleague Charlotte because she like her expertise and her experience in the industry has really allowed me to learn like so much about how exactly to structure my thoughts um, in a way that kind of best serves our appeal. And so far, um, I think we have about 185 um, signatures from agencies specifically. So that's just like the different companies. And then what we're planning to do is that we hope to kind of gear up and incorporate those outside of the management sector next week because um, we're trying to start a petition on change.org, um, which we hope will have like anyone who wishes to sign it, including artists, including other industry colleagues. Um, and we thought it would be more important at this point to get our initial letter out to our different um, colleagues who are leaders around the country and then have them sign it um, and then take time for the petition to kind of like build and to gain traction in the media when a lot of other voices and signatures are involved. I have no experience with anything like this. Is there a certain number of signatures needed before Congress would take it seriously? How does that work or how do you think about that? Yeah, I'm definitely learning along with us um, as we're going. I don't know if there's a threshold, but personally to me, like, I'll just throw a number out there, 10,000. That seems like something that would at least gain a little bit of attention and hopefully, you know, many thousands more as people share it as really like it enters some sort of conversation. Mm -hmm. There's been, I forget the acronym, but the Independent Venue Association. I, I want to say they've, I think they're trying to do something similar too, just in terms of getting direct federal aid specifically for independent venues. Uh, you mentioned change.org. So is that something that someone listening to this now can go to or that'll be ready in a week or how does that work? Sorry, there's a siren going by. That's okay. I don't hear anything. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for asking. I would um, love to send you the link to the petition when it's live. Um, and perhaps we could include it in the description of this episode, just so it's like easily accessible. Um, that's Absolutely. definitely the best place to find um, the letter text and to sign your name. Um, I can also create just a universal PDF link for anyone who wishes to just read the contents of the letter and we can um, post that in the description as well. That'd be great. Or if it makes sense, maybe we could even include the letter as part of this episode um, announcement. Um, I don't know if that's Oh, possible. wow, that'd be great. Yeah, I would love that. We might as well just put it as the description for the episode is what I'm saying, with the links there. Um, Amazing, I, thanks so much. We got it, we'll see it. But also if there is a link, uh, for whatever reason people don't get this email that'll go out about the episode, that they can go to, we'll definitely make sure they know where, how to find that as well. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Um, is there anything else about the petition it's worth mentioning, because I had some other questions for you guys that were more general industry questions. But I want to make sure. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Um, to kind of wrap up on the letter, I did want to highlight how Laura had actually um, made me aware of this National Governors Association report, NGA, um, which was kind of this countrywide survey of how the arts are playing an integral role in catalyzing economic revival in a lot of different communities around the country, which is especially pertinent now because um, our economy is shut down and like so like 40 million people are unemployed. Um, and I feel like that's important for us to keep in mind. Like that's kind of the larger purpose of why we're writing this letter. And also um, I included this study that the NEA did, which 
they found that 760 billion is the amount that the arts contribute to the US economy over one year and they employ nearly 5 million Americans. So to me like that alone kind of like, I hope that that can spur people to being more aware of what is at stake. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the logistics and the options you have available, if you go to a concert, people aren't aware that all the economic impact that happens with that, maybe somebody came from out of town and stayed at a hotel and they went down the street to get dinner before the concert or yes, all exactly. of those things are not happening right now because these events cannot happen right now. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. Exactly. For sure. Um, okay, so what are some of the other things you guys might be hearing from other presenters in terms of their plans for reopening? Because for me, the past almost three months now, you know, working with artists has been a very helpless feeling that I can't do the one thing I'm supposed to do. So I guess for my, on my end, I've tried to have conversations every day and just keep my finger on the pulse of like what are presenters dealing with and and I'll let you I'm, I'm curious to hear what you guys have found but in my experience it's really difficult because not only is there no uniform information coming down at the federal level about how to do this meaning it's all state level if there's such a difference between if we're talking about a performing arts center or a small club or a festival right so there's so many layers of uncertainty to this um, and I, I just would love to hear from you guys, like what are some things you're hearing and how does, how does it feel on your end? Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Mike. These are great questions. Um, and it's, I've been having a lot of those same sorts of conversations too um, with presenters across the board. Um, and uh, the big thing is that there is no one way of doing all this that I'm finding. Um, I am hearing different things across the board. Um, for the most part, people are trying to find alternative ways of presenting um, to stay within guidelines um, and coming up with new ideas, um, cutting things down to, uh, or ramping things up to two shows instead of one show, but making it a shorter show is one thing that, that some promoters are doing. Um, and the, but then doing settlement is, you know, a single show settlement for the artist. Um, other things that have come into play have been moving concerts outside where that's available, where the weather is okay. Um, I'm, I'm working with a presenter in Texas that is talking about doing that because they feel like we can take our chances with the weather and um, see how that goes. Um, but they're gung-ho and moving forward. Uh, and then, um, you know, it's, it's uh, it, it, one of the presenters I work a lot with um, are orchestras in, across the North America. And that has been interesting because that's where I'm seeing kind of the biggest range of how do we do this? Because you're talking about, they've got so many forces involved. <sighs> How do you social distance um, a group of that size um, in the venues that they're using? Are they allowed, a lot of them don't own their own venues. Um, are they allowed to even be in their venues next season? They don't know. Um, and that's where I'm finding people are trying to move more towards uh, doing virtual activities. Um, and that's where I found too, um, a lot of our artists are working with them to really tailor something special as well um, for that specific organization. Um, and same things with some festivals, uh, especially if they've um, worked with the artist in the past, some way of just providing something to that audience to keep that core base, even if they can't provide a full season um, of, of entertainment that um, they're providing something and some kind of output that's unique and special for that community itself. So yeah, there's been a lot of different ways to skin the cat on this one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Live, <clears throat> live streaming is definitely sort of the hot, hot topic right now. And I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago who he's developed this platform for 
it's not a platform. It's uh, it's it's like a, literally a rig. It has high definition cameras and microphones and everything, and he can send it out to a venue or to an artist. Uh, and and from his end, virtually, he can mix and master, which is really cool. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because he made a good point, which was that people have to stop thinking about live streaming as um, as like an alternative to a concert, and instead think of it as a completely separate or its own thing. You know. It has nothing to do with recreating, <clears throat> excuse me, a live concert experience. It's completely different. And I think that's one thing I'm seeing or I'm hearing from presenters who are trying to figure out how do we do that. The approach is literally trying to recreate a show that they would do on their stage virtually. And as I learn more about that, I think it makes sense to not think of it that way at all, actually. Um, and then, yeah. I mean, you know, who knows what it'll be like, let's just say 12 months from now, if hopefully by then we're able to do live shows again, will people, will patrons expect the option for both? Like, will they have come to be used to the convenience of a live stream? And then they also want the option of a, of a live ticket. And I think all this just remains to be seen. It's really hard to say. Yeah, that uncertainty is the most crippling. And I think troubling factor to all of this in terms of translating what in my opinion can only have the effect that it has live into a virtual space mm -hmm. and for me like yes there have been some live stream and virtual um either concerts or like shorter performances that have really moved me and have shown me like yeah this is why we need music more than ever and then there are some that are just like, you know, this is not, I just feel like we just shouldn't be doing this right. um, because in some way it is sort of, it almost like devalues what makes artists, what makes art so special um, and so necessary. So that's definitely something we all have to reckon with. Yeah, it's, it's really tough because the more free live stream concerts are out there by any given artist, the less likely somebody might be to pay a virtual ticket for that artist. But I can understand it from the artist's perspective, which is like, what else can I do right now? Right, so it's really tough. Um, the only other thing I wanted to touch on um, about, that I, I just wanna make sure I don't forget to say it, is this idea of not having like uniform protocol in place and thinking about how this translates to tours. Um, I'm not sure I have anything super insightful to say on that other than it's something I think about a lot, but maybe there's a tie-in to the petition itself, I don't know or at least some sort of recognition that there is a need to have uniform standards in place. So that uncertainty isn't as great when we try to book tours, which as you guys know, takes months and months and months and months in advance, right? And how could you possibly do that if you have to cut out parts of the country that are not, that, that, that they don't have uh, protocols up to, you know, up to um, standard, right? I, it's, it's kind of a daunting thought. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of of the mindset and I'm no expert on how the federal and state governments all work, but um, my thought generally about this is it seems like it's hard enough in terms of just, you know, we look at schools and uh, schools opening, closing, what's going to happen to them in the fall and that's going kind of state by state um and depending on what's going to happen so i almost feel like if we try to include something that we really don't have control over um because these protocols may be right for one state but really unnecessary and maybe costly for another state mm -hmm. um and and place to to put into place um and i think because there's so many differing protocols that each governor um, is putting in place for their state, it would be hard to advocate for that to be across the board um, when they can't even seem to get the response across the board in general <laughs> about the pandemic. Um, right. So I almost felt like it would uh, maybe be muting some of our other topics of the letter we would want to approach and, and have touched upon and highlighted. Yeah, I hear you, definitely. Speaking of protocols and everything, I mean, I'm generally only aware of um, events. It's called eventsafetyalliance.org, which has a lot of great information and resources. So if anybody listening isn't aware of that, I would suggest that as a resource for sure. 
probably addresses a lot of what we're talking about. Yeah. There's another similar document, so like a 50 page document um, that I haven't fully read from the um, arts presenters, uh, Associated Performing Arts Presenters, APAP, has um, developed and put out, so. Okay, and you could probably find that on the APAP website? Yes, I, I actually, I have a link for it, so I can, I can send that and we can post it with the podcast. Great, yeah, that'd be great. What are some of the things you guys are hearing from your own artists right now in terms of how they're thinking about this and when the question is posed, like, if you could do a show in a few months, are you comfortable going on a plane? And um, have you guys, you know, is there, do you, are you finding that there, people are generally thinking one way about this or does it depend on the artist? Um, I think it's depending on the artist somewhat, um, but, the overall feel um, that I've had from the artists is that they are willing to get out there. I mean, assuming that we would feel it was a safe too, like I would never, and I'm sure, you know, Cindy on the management front too, would never want to put artists in an unsafe position to be there and on the agent side, neither would I. Um, but um, I'm finding, especially, you know, we were talking about some of the virtual things and um, some of the bands or on, and ensembles um, don't live together, but as, you know, so some of the guidelines are relaxing a little bit um, and it's possible to maybe get them together. Well, they're willing to maybe drive to travel to get together put something together themselves as a group and, and that's easier. Um, and another thing I have heard from some presenters is that they are really trying to draw on regional talent rather than having people fly and fly in from places. Um, and um, so drivable guest artists. And if, if you can tap into those regional presenters for your artists, um, you know, wherever they're residing, uh, that's, that's something great, you know, bring together community um, if they're presenting things. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's all unraveling um, and we'll see how it continues to unravel. Yeah. yeah, adding on to Laura's comments, like I feel super fortunate that the artists we work with are, have been so open and so open-minded about different live streams or digital content while it's impossible to like be an artist and like do their work what they do so well and personally like I've learned so much from their resilience and from their acceptance of what it, this just like absurdly difficult and bizarre and strange situation um like we mentioned this in the letter there's this um Americans in the Arts survey um of I think 10,000 and counting arts workers and creatives in America. And they found that 95% um, of them have experienced loss of income as a result of, result of COVID. Um, and they have an average estimated decline in income yearly for 24,000. And that's just the average. Um, so these are the circumstances that we're up against. And yet to have them not be bitter and like to be excited about how can we you know deal with this time together that's been amazing and I think yes everyone misses the stage we miss what we love about it and why we choose to devote our work to this um, because it's the excitement of live shows and the power it has to unify us and really just move us beyond most of what we experience day to day um, so I think it's that kind of, it's that nostalgia and the missing that is like motivating us to work on what is otherwise really hard to work on. <laughs> well, yeah, and also if you think about it, like the idea of a global shutdown and for the sake of our conversation for the arts, I realize that most, a lot of industries have been affected too, but the arts are typically what people turn to for inspiration and um, community and all of those things. And it's, I have a hard time getting my head around the idea that we're living in a time where that's the one thing we can't do right now. 
right? Like we can't turn to the art. I mean, we can all listen to recorded music right now and we can watch live streams, but we can't come together as, com as part of a community to support the arts and to experience the arts. And that's a, that's a really tough thing, you know, when it's, when it's needed now more than ever. So. Yes, it's definitely one of those great ironies. And especially recently for me in the past week, um, the violence and the pain around Black Lives Matter, um, around the murder of George Floyd and of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, like plus countless names, um, is just... It's so awful that like, it's profoundly difficult to work. Like, I feel this like cognitive dissonance of like, you know, I'm just like sitting here with my laptop. Like, yes, I care about music and I care about the arts, but like, I wanna do something or like, I feel like compelled to, you know, act beyond being angry and being sad and ashamed and frustrated. Um, and so for me personally, my view on the industry in general definitely needs to be like, you know, we need to confront like a lot of the cultural appropriation that happens. We need to confront a lot of diversity and equity issues that are very pervasive. And I think if we use the classical genre as an example, there are many aspects of it, whether we like it or not, whether we choose or not, that kind of uphold the concept of white supremacy, um, even if the practice or kind of how that's reflected is not conscious and not deliberate. Um, there are specific scripts for who can perform what, or like who is allowed to have agency over a specific piece or a specific composer. And those have been hundreds of years in the making. And if I, you know, I don't know when is a better time to really like for every kind of institution, big and small, but especially the large ones, which have a lot of power in the country to just like understand, like these are some concrete action steps that we can take to start disentangling and dismantling all of this. I'm so glad you brought that up on this conversation. Thank you, because it's, it's certainly what we're all seeing right now. And, and um, you know, thank you for naming the names too. And one thing I keep thinking about just at a very basic level is when I'm at the regional booking conferences or uh, just the relationships I've developed um, since I've been doing this, the reality is that I can think of just a few people of color who I work with in the arts, specifically on the presenting or agency side or management side. Um, and that begs the question, what opportunities have been given to white people over them, right? That begs the question if we're talking about maybe a performing arts center at a college or university, the hiring process for that position. I mean, it, it's also interrelated. Um, and it really is something that I hope if there's any silver lining with these horrible deaths recently that will start to be talked about and addressed and just that we don't, we don't wanna settle for what it used to be. Like we, this is the time to make a difference. You know, and it's it's really tough, but it, I think it starts with a dialogue like this. So again, thanks for bringing it up. Definitely, Cindy. I, I also want to point out too, with you know, bringing up some of the regional booking conferences. Um, I there has been um, in in recent years, there's been much more. Um, dialogue happening around the topic too of including diversity in the field um and um you know in some cases some of these conferences have offered um workshops in addition to the conference um i've taken part uh in one of those um with a conference too uh just you know adding on a day to my conference and and doing that and um you know, maybe integrating it more into the actual conference, you know, repertoire um, and, and uh, schedule um, is, you know, we've got to keep this dialogue and, and everything going. I mean, you know, the, the yes. we're recording this right now, of course, is following yesterday's Blackout Tuesday. And, you know, what breaks my heart is I'm so scared that like, 
okay, that was one day, great, but we're gonna let the ball drop um, again. And I, I think we have to bring each other up to the mark to say we can't, we can't let the ball drop on this anymore. We have to keep talking about it and instituting change um, because you know change, it does take a long time for change to happen and it's it's gonna take time and we've got to keep the process going and the ball moving. I yeah. could not agree more. Yeah, I think it has to be an integral part of every institution's policy making, decision making, and as gatekeepers, really, um, our role um, when working with artists, like we should not underestimate the fact that we can have an impact on diversity and equality in the culture at large. And we should be very conscious of those decisions and what conversations we're having. And we shouldn't be afraid to call people out when they're making comments that hurt people, whether directly or, you know, decisions behind closed doors that exclude people deliberately. Um, and I think it's going to be painful. It's going to be really hard and it's going to take a long time, but this is an uphill battle that's been being fought for the last, like, what 400 years and you know we have not done enough that's like kind of I think the summary of the whole thing so yeah I'm really happy that we have allies like yourselves in the industry for sure because that's where everyone needs to be on board yeah I guess I would just say one more thing that came to mind while we're talking about this is it's no secret that the vast majority of performing arts center audiences are older white audiences it's a conversation I have a lot with um, some of the black artists that I work with, uh, specifically jazz musicians, right? Why is that the case? And I, I wish I had like a better answer for that aside from the obvious, which gets into demographics and income levels and the, the whole disparity. And, um, but I think it is relevant to what we're talking about because, you know, we're largely basing our businesses, our business model on the performing arts model, right? And so how do you, I mean, we're kind of getting off topic from the petition, but like, how do you address that as it relates to the performing arts? I don't know, <laughs> it's tough, but it's, a re it's the reality that we have to acknowledge. Well, and I think you're bringing up a lot of good starting points to a start of more dialogue about this. And that's exactly what we were talking about with the, the petition, you know, with the whole movement, you know, it, if we start talking about it now, well, let's let's keep having those conversations um, with people and bringing them up. Um, you know, bring the artists into those conversations directly, and maybe make that part of the programming now more and more. Um, and um, you know, as the national conversation develops, you know, we may find that the audiences are willing to put themselves in an uncomfortable audience setting to to do that. And I think that would be great. I would I would love that. So, um, yeah, same. And, and I think it's really show peaceful dialogue among the country happening around it. Yeah, Cindy, what were you going to say? I definitely agree with that, Laura. And I think it's also important that there's not a, we don't approach this with like a quota mentality of like, um, you know, I'm just going to say you're going to like collaborate with this artist of color for example or advise that like an artist should collaborate with this person of color and then like that's it because it's like in vogue or whatever like that is that's actually probably the worst counterproductive thing that could happen because that's further otherizing an already marginalized identity and community and i think the more you highlight um a group's tokenism um, without actually taking steps to see how you have been complicit in it and reinforcing it is that's like where the trouble happens and that's when the hole is dug deeper. So I think that's something that I think would be really great for whoever, like, but especially if you work in the arts, like to understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, just to kind of circle back to the petition, is there anything else, um, Cindy, that we should, you, you'd like to mention about it? I mean, we've talked about um, how people can go find it. Is there an easy way for them to contact you if they want more information after listening to this? Um, yeah, you've asked such great questions, Mike, that 
um, we've managed to cover like essentially the entire letter. Um, and I'm happy to be contacted directly. Um, maybe once the change.org petition is live, I can include a link for like questions or comments or feedback in the uh, content of the petition itself. So it's just kind of like available for anyone who wants to use it. Great. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time today and for talking about this. Thanks again for creating this initiative, for pushing it forward. Um, I really appreciate it, and it's something that I, I think a lot of people are going to benefit from hearing about, so thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Really appreciate you creating this space for us to talk about these topics. My pleasure. Yeah, it was good to see you guys. Nice to meet you, Cindy. <laughs> thank you. Bye.